Hey everyone, how's it going? And welcome back to Citywide Blackout, your home for music, movies, and more. I'm your host, Max Bowen. And I gotta tell you folks, I am so excited for this episode because once again, I am joined by comic artist and creator Jason Lowe to talk about The All Nighter, a series available only on Comixology Originals. Now this series is totally complete and available on the app, but on March 16th, you can officially add it to your shelf because it comes out in print at comic stores near you. And this series, it really caught my eye because the story is just so damn unique. Vampires in the human world as superheroes. You know, whoever said there are no new ideas has not read this series, and you gotta check it out. And in this episode, Jason and I do a deep dive into the story, its origins, and what it was like to once again work with Chip Zdarsky. If that name seems familiar, it's because we had Chip and Jason on the show a while back to talk about their project, Afterlift, also a Comixology Originals title. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. It's great to have you here. It's a it's a very crazy time in the world right now. Uh, of course, I'm sure you, your eyes are all glued to the TV, to your phones, reading about what's happening in the Ukraine. Uh, it, it's hard to wrap my head around that. To wake up one morning to find another country taking part of yours, taking the entire thing. Basically, it's gonna sound cliche. It's gonna sound a little trite, but I would just say thoughts are with them. You know, because this is. This is a hellacious experience for them to be going through, and I, I, I can't imagine my nice little comfortable life here in the states. I can't imagine what it's like to have something like that taken down my home, essentially taken away. So, hope everyone's just kind of doing what they can, uh, get uh, getting through this, and uh, just reach out to someone. You know, this is a, a stressful time for a lot of us, and uh, reach out to someone if you're feeling down, if you're feeling stressed, just call someone, anyone. That's what they're there for. But uh, we're going to try and lift those spirits a little bit because we're going to be talking about my one great love in the world, and that is comics. Well, one of many, actually. Of course, I'm sure a lot of you have been checking out The All-Nighter, which you can find exclusively on Comixology Originals. And uh, I've got the, the great pleasure of talking to the artist for that series, which is now fully out there. It's fully complete. If you're like me, you like that feel of a comic in your hands, March 16th is a date to mark on your calendars. This is when this will be out in print, so be sure to get your copy. I'll be getting mine. And joining me now, this is the man here, folks, Jason Liu, the artist for the series. We had him on the show a little while back to talk, uh, talk about Afterlift. He joins us here today. Jason, welcome back, man. It is so good to have you here. Thanks for having me, Max. All right, all right. So so how does it feel to now have the all-nighter making the cut to be on shelves very soon? Uh, it, it feels great, especially, you know, it, it's going to be, published by Dark Horse Comics, who have been very great to us. And uh, to have a book like All Nighter, which will be alphabetically shelved right after Afterlift on your local bookshelf, uh, (laughs) done by the same team, uh, I think that will make it easier for fans to just, if if you don't have Afterlift or All Nighter, pick up both at the same time. Exactly, and I really like that, how Afterlift, All Night are right next to each other. It's perfect. Almost <laughs> almost like you planned it out. Sort of. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, for, for the longest while, we, we uh, this one under a different title while we were working on this during a pandemic. So all of my file names were uh, labeled Super Night. Because that's what we were going for. Oh wow! So 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 what happened to uh, to change the name? Um, it was almost like a last minute decision, I guess, when we were uh, finalizing the deal with with Comicsology. Okay, and I think they they like all nighter better, and and I think that was the that was already the name of the diner in in our story. That's right. That's right. Oh, that makes sense. You know, names are tough. Names are tough. They're very hard to pick that one title that really sells a story, really captures it too. I think it can be the kind of thing you just like, okay, we, we have like 20 options here. None of them are good. What else do we do? Yeah, exactly. I, I thought Super Knight would have uh, been a fighting contender since it's, it's just fun and silly. But then again, it's, it's, uh, it, it will take away from the tone that we're going for with the story because it does get really dark. Yes, with, the, this 
horror mythology. Yeah, this this is definitely not a lighthearted romp. This is a very this is a very serious story. We'll dive right into that uh, right now, folks. So so this story is all about like a group of vampires living in the human world. They're just like interacting it. So so in this world, the creatures of myth are very real. And they do their best as they can to kind of interact and be a part of the of the human world. So Alex, who is kind of our like main character, he's working in the uh, working in this diner, also as you mentioned, called the All Nighter, that mm-hmm. the vampires run, and he's bored. He hates this. He is very old, way older than he looks, and he wants to have a real life. Alex is also a major like myself. He's also a major comic and superhero nerd. And one day he gets a chance to actually do this thing. It's kind of a happenstance thing. It's kind of happens. He's walking home. Someone gets mugged and he gets to be a hero. And it goes from there. I won't say anything else because, folks, you got to read it. I love this concept. It made me think like, you know, the people always say that there's like no new ideas. I think this book proves that there are some some like new ideas. But a question for you: um, When it came to working on the concept, did you go through a lot of like iterations before you hit one that said, "Okay, this is actually going to work"? Yeah. So h- how the idea started was uh, okay. So definitely, like after the success and, and wrapping up Afterlip, Chip and I sat down and had dinner together to plan out our next project, and. He asks me what I feel like drawing, and and I already like had like maybe three to five pitch ideas to him of of what might gel with him, and, and so one of the early ideas of All Nighter was I I wanted uh, a story that follows uh like like the, this this family of vampires not necessarily not related by blood but just by being kindred spirits, I guess. They yeah, they run an all night diner that has that has a portal for for other monsters to go through and it and it's acts as a sanctuary for for uh these vampires because these are vampires that are just trying to survive uh the working grind without killing people for blood. Uh they're just finding other alternatives to get their fix. So uh, it, it started out there. It, it, it was more like a, like an analogy of like, like vampires are this immigrant family and they're just trying to survive in this world and, and trying to help out other vampires. And I also told Chip, like after, after lift, like a, a, a title that had a very universal message that anyone can connect with that didn't have any superheroes i told him let's do another series that doesn't deal with superheroes we don't need to do this like let's just tell a various serious type story and uh so he took this idea and then he plotted out a five issue outline and it had superheroes in it and i was like damn it chip like i thought we're not gonna be doing superheroes (laughs) <laughs> but then as I read further into the outline and when I read the first issue, he brought me back into loving to work on superheroes again because I I thought I was like done, like not wanting to do superheroes. I thought I can just kind of coast my comic career by just doing serious stuff. But then he brought me back into loving superheroes again with, with uh, the all-nighter. <laughs> and it made the story much more better. <laughs> I love how how like this is what you like didn't want like didn't want to do. And Chip's like superhero story. Like God damn it, Chip. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh Chip. Yo, know, he's dragging you like back in. Now, of course, uh, for the folks who don't know, this is uh, Chip uh, Zadarsky. He was the writer for uh, Afterlift. So you had, so you have um uh, worked uh, with him before. I believe last time was actually your first time working with him, right? first big comic thing yes okay uh because like my early thing was was like back when uh like i was a college intern like back in like 2004 before like you know he was before he did his marvel stuff and dc stuff like he was just an illustrator and i i I just i just i was just his color assistant for his uh illustrations that were used for educational children's books that you only will find in the library 
but yeah, Afterlift was our our first collaborative mainstream comic that that we got to work together on. Okay, tell me about the working relationship of Chip. Like, what's it like being partnered with him for another story? He's very collaborative and very supportive, uh, especially since like we're going in and like like we're we're going in as co-creators. Like, so this is fifty fifty. Like he, I, I would come up with the like the character designs of uh, you know, but just based on a very simple pitch. Like, just here is an idea of like some of the the archetype characters that we can have in our story and and the type of people that I wouldn't want to draw in the story. And then he he would take that and then tries to fit that in. So like yeah, like I I really wanted to to have like a an Asian lead superhero in this, and uh, like I'm I'm glad that that came through with with Alex. And then yeah, he he comes with the, with the story, and and there's times where like I would there, there would be like certain details where like I, I want to make sure that we we hit on because. Uh, some of these details will get repeated in, in later issues, which you'll see in in, uh, <laughs> in the first volume. Uh, yeah, there, there there are some details, some seeds that we plant for for later volumes in, in this ongoing series. Oh, I like that. I like that because I think we talked about this with Afterlift that that was more of like a one off. That was always meant to be just like a one volume story. So cool to see that mm-hmm. we're seeing more vampires being superheroes and uh, I want to touch a bit on Alex because you mentioned him uh, being uh, uh, being uh, the Asian lead which we don't see a lot in comics we're seeing it more um, one thing I kind of like though is that he's a very organic character you know he's something you can relate to he's being he feels imprisoned he feels kind of trapped I guess uh, when, it, when it came to like developing the characters did you have to spend a lot of time kind of like crafting how their look or their feel Definitely. Um, like when, when it comes to characters like Alex, like pretty much every character, um, just figuring out what kind of wardrobes they would wear, like consciously, like you have to go in like side their heads. Like uh, there was a character named Cynthia uh, who she she's she works as uh, the waitress at the all nighter, but. In her past life, she was a CEO of a big uh, corporation. There are elements of their past life before they were vampires that ties in with their appearances, uh, layered with, you know, their like their their regular working garbs, working in the diner. Um, for for Alex, when when it came to like designing his costume. Um, you know, he's a big comic nerd, so he's so into it. So uh, I had to make sure his costume looks as good as, uh, a, a, like, a phenomenal cosplayer that you would see at a convention. Not like a phenomenal costume you would see in a Marvel film, but, yeah, scaled down, like, very realistic, like you would see in person at a convention. And, yeah, there there's a lot of characters that decide to play dress-up as superheroes or supervillains because that is in the story that is the loophole where these monsters can be themselves in human society um so you had i I had to think about how creative and and how crafty are they so alex of course he, he he's great but you know a villain like the trolls that we see in in the later issue you know, they have like big fat fingers. So, and you know, they're, they're only using the costume idea just as an accessory to, to do bad things. So their costumes are very half fast and very rough. Um, so yeah, like you really got to get in each character's head to, uh, with their wardrobe. Mm. I really got that because especially the scene they mentioned with the trolls, and it's not a spoiler, it's just it's then this is an issue two, I believe, where Alex meets with the trolls, and this is after Alex has, you know, donned his costume and become the superhero. And the trolls are like, You're that guy who's out there, you know, like being a hero. And he's like, uh yeah, he's like, and, and then he hugs and like, thank you for, for uh, giving us the idea. Now we can be, you know, monsters and hurt people and do this thing in broad daylight. Like, thanks, I guess. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> yeah that 
really opens a Pandora box. So, yeah, you, you get to see just a, an assortment of, of classic monsters in this series reinvented, but also, yeah, reinvented in the modern time, but also how would they look in a superhero costume? That, like, there's just so many layers behind these characters. Like, I had to, I had to figure out like what kind of gimmick, what kind of superhero gimmick would each of these characters have? And Chip didn't even give them any superhero names <laughs> when we were designing them. So I was like, all right, well, I'm going to make this guy look like he is very nocturnal, like Batman in a way. Uh, and yeah, it, it, uh, I find it funny that, uh, uh, yeah, Chip called them uh night shock maybe in the third issue and it's like you know what I, I think that really fits with the very uh pointy shocky uh outline of his cape mm -hmm. now you mentioned chip uh, not giving a whole lot of like direction for the for the costumes i'm curious as to how that benefits you as the artist that you're not really that you're just gave, given basically free reign to kind of do what you want well, yeah, that that's where like the the fifty fifty of being a co creator of the series comes to play. Where like we there there is that responsibility or accountability <laughs> uh, to to own up to to that own uh, that ownership. But but it's it's also great as well. Um, like it, it's it's great to to have Chip know that. You know, but before Afterlift, that like I, I've been an established storyteller myself through the Pitiful Human Lizard, Toronto Zone superhero, offbeat superhero. Um, so like he he really wants like that side of me to to really shine in in our story. I like that. I I, I like that he's sort of giving you that just you know blank Kevin saying, okay, I'm not gonna tell you what to do. You know what to do. I think it's that trust he has in you, obviously. Exactly. All right. All right. Um, so as I mentioned before, we're not going to spoil any uh, details. We want to touch a little bit on, on, on uh, some of the elements of this world where monsters are very real and they're integrating into human society. I want to ask about the takers because they're mentioned right off the bat as being a major threat. Who are the takers? And without any kind of spoilers, what role do they play in the overall story? The takers are... Uh... They're this entity that makes the monsters fear them because they're they're the ones that kind of set this rule that the monsters cannot interfere with human society. Like they must remain hidden. They must not use their uh, their monster powers to 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 threaten any humans because if any of the monsters are tempted to do so that's when uh the shadowy figures of the takers come in and take them away ah, that's all i'm gonna say <laughs> i see what you did there i see what you did there yeah. i like that um do they do do we get to learn more about them as the series progresses not only in this volume but in future volumes Definitely. I'm, I'm a, we're actually like halfway through volume two and I actually get to draw uh, a hint of them. I'll just say that. <laughs> I love it. I, I love that hint of a character. I like that when it's not revealed, just boom out there right away. I like that we get the slow reveal to kind of as things go along. Have you always been that way when it comes to like your drawings? Do you do that slow, gradual showcase? Oh, definitely. But like, especially since, I mean, we, we've got, we've introduced to the readers, like a whole stack of characters like that, that are just rich with their own history. We, we want to focus on them both because they're more interesting and especially the, the, the family of vampires, the, the all nighter crew, like there's so much history uh, that we still need to dig in through, and and you'll learn a lot more in volume two. Ah. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> there, there's just so much that we we want to reveal before, you know, we 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 show the takers because 
Yeah, there's just so much interesting things uh, with the Almighty Group. Mm -hmm. How did you pitch this to the folks at Comixology? I imagine they're probably really happy with you guys, especially after the success of Afterlift. Yeah, I mean, like the Eisner Award really did help. Like, really did this, really did give us leverage. It took some time to convince them because they were really aiming to have titles not relate to superheroes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh like so yeah they, they just wanted like to have titles that just explored the storytelling uh medium with without superheroes and here we are we're we're, int <laughs> we're introducing a title with superheroes but you know we, we had to convince them that this is not your conventional superhero story um especially since this is in a world where there were never superheroes in the first place like they're all fictional uh they're, they're only seen in the comic books and and movies that alex reads and 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 watches so it, it is definitely a different spin of that uh and we we heavily focus more on the m monster mythology behind these characters uh like a, a, a reimagining of these these monsters and yeah the superheroes that's just that's just dressing. <laughs> That's just dressing over the, the monsters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. I want to talk about the Eisner Award. First off, congratulations to you and the whole team, because that's such a huge, huge milestone to hit. Your reaction to finding out that Afterlift had won the Eisner? It was crazy. I mean, it, it, it's, it's pretty weird because, you know, we won the Eisner in 2020. Uh, at the virtual version of, of San Diego, San Diego Comic Con, and you know, like it would have been just such a dream to actually be there in person. But you know, like we we, we gotta take the best of the situation. Me and my friends, we we actually had a group viewing of this. Uh, me, Paris, and and Allison, uh, and a bunch of our friends. Uh, as we were watching the show with Phil Lamar hosting and me being a big, not just a Samurai Jack fan, but yeah, Samurai Jack and, and Justice League fan, Futurama, to, to hear him like say our names as we won that Eisner, it was crazy. But I mean, <laughs> because it was virtual, like I, I, I felt like I was still tied in front of my laptop and I, I, like i didn't find myself jumping <laughs> for joy like i was i was like you know like when and, it, and, and it's shouting but you know it's it's not the same but i mean i i, I thought it was it, it was cool to see phil uh phil lamar like say our names as we won that award <laughs> that's a really cool experience and i definitely agree like being virtual i mean unfortunately it's what we had to do at the time but yeah like 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 not being there with like all your peers and your colleagues to celebrate with them too but like i said like you know you're in your laptop you can't just like jump you're like yahoo you kind of like sit there like yay <laughs> all right we won great job guys like there, there's some pros and cons because like like one neat thing would have been like to go to the convention the next day and like you know carry my like carry my Eisner and, and, and flaunt at the, on the comic floor because that's it's that's something I never thought would ever happen to to, to win an Eisner uh, especially like w with some of the stuff that I've done before Afterlift uh, I, I never thought something like that would happen and, and and that Eisner really got me recognized in the whole comic book industry uh, a plus side to watching this virtually was i get to sleep in my own bed i didn't have to like worry about a hotel i didn't have to worry about going to the convention and getting con flu i get to sleep in so there's that <laughs> hey plus and minus man i, I would have so been just like carrying the war around like i said carrying the war the next day be like hey look at me i won the eisner look at, hey check this out check out my eisner <laughs> <laughs> Stop by the Marvel and DC booth. <laughs> oh yeah! Hey guys, look what I got! Did you get this? I don't think so. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's my portfolio. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, you know, just you know, you know, Eisner Award-winning artist Jason Liu. Check out my uh, portfolio, guys. Hire me. <laughs> See you later. Exactly. Oh yeah, yeah. You 
you gotta, man. You gotta because, like, you know, hopefully this kind of thing will happen to you a lot in the future. Hopefully you'll 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 get to accept accept an Eisner at the in person Comic Cons for the all nighter, you know. But yeah, but it's such 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 an amazing thing to just hear your name and to know that your name's on that award, and they can never take that away from you. No, and and I can add Eisner Award winning in my profile. Yeah, exactly. My LinkedIn, exactly. My Twitter, yeah. your business cards. You know, Eisner Award winning artist. I mean, that's exactly that's, that really says it all. Um, you know, I'm actually curious this thing because um, I think for the folks at home who may not be sort of aware, where does the Eisner fall in the hierarchy of comic awards? I think it's like the Oscars of of uh, in the comic book in, is industry. It's uh. Yeah, it's like the Oscars. I, I don't think there's anything like higher than that because like they, they recognize comics all around the world. So like just like the Academy Awards, you know, as much through the the lens of North American industry. So yeah, it it it, it is winning the big one actually, and then you know the, we we also won the Joe Schuster Award, which is the Canadian. Oscars or in Canada, what, what what do we call it? Uh, we I, we go we got the Junos, which is like the Canadian Music Award. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, J- Joe Schuster Award. Uh, we won that for for Afterlift. So yeah, it was great to win the Canadian and, and American, like wow. the highest awards. And now you get to put multi award winning artist on your business card. Yeah, totally. Yeah, <laughs> it's definitely on my LinkedIn. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Now, now, winning those awards, how does that inspire you in terms of your next project? Do you sort of, do you, do you sort of feel like, okay, I've won these awards, the world has kind of recognized the skill, now it's time for me to bring my A-game to this thing? Yeah. Um, y- you know, it, it's funny that um, – Last year, actually, it, last year, I got to work on a lot of dream projects of mine uh, because I'm a huge Star Wars fan and I'm a huge Jamie Madrox, Multiple Man fan. And uh, I I had the pleasure of working on both things. Uh, me and Chip got to co-write a Star Wars story together um, and I got to draw it. And I got to write and draw a Jamie Madrix short. Now, but the, but the funny thing was with the, when it came to Marvel, it, it was not through the Eisners. It was it, it was just out of like weird luck. Like it was like a Sunday afternoon. Uh, someone tweeted out uh, this fan comic that I did of Jamie Madrox that's told in multiple ways, like a choose your own adventure. It was something that I did eight years ago. And my friend shared it to Dan Slot on Twitter. And Tom Brevoort, the senior VP of Marvel, saw that. And he was like, I got to have this in our book. He tweeted at me. And uh, he found a way to contact me. Uh, because the funny thing was, like, I, I reached out to him. But I guess but my emails bounced back to me. But he managed to ask around even asked chip for my email address and that's where he got me connected with like a bunch of like marvel editors and and i was like finally like my like that dream come true of like like one of the reasons why i wanted to do comics back when i was in high school is, is marvel comics and and uh living that dream <laughs> absolutely what was the star wars you worked on so i worked on a number of star wars stuff so the first thing that me and Chip worked on was a Lando Calrissian story for Star Wars Adventures 2021, the annual issue. And then they asked me to to draw a variant cover for that. Uh, we, we got to work with uh, Heather Antos, and she just dug my work that she would ask me to do like some vari- some more variants for their Star Wars High Republic Adventures line. So I, I did a couple variants, and then they're like, she was like, would you want to do the art for one of the stories in the High Republic Adventures annual? So I got to illustrate a story that's written by Claudia Gray, one of my favorite Star Wars authors. Uh, I've, I've been a big fan of 
her work with the Lost Stars and and the Princess Leia manga series. So yeah, it, that was just a great experience, and and just to check that off my bucket list that I got to work with like, and it's one of my favorite Star Wars authors. That is so cool. I've been reading a lot of the Star Wars comics, and I've been loving them, especially uh, the Bounty Hunter Wars. That had me hooked. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, what, what, what's great is, like, you know, you're also, like, you're, you're when you're pitching these ideas, they all go through Lucasfilm, the, the story group, so, because they want to make sure it's all connected with everything they establish. And uh, so, yeah, it, it was it was really surreal to come up with these new characters, especially when it came to the story that me and, and Chip wrote. Like, I, I, I created these these characters, designed them, named them, and to later see them on the Wikipedia, <laughs> which is the Star Wars Wikipedia, where, you know, it, like, there's no better database of for, for Star Wars canon than the Wikipedia. Uh, it, it's such an honor to see, like, every character that I designed and named has, uh, has their own article. Oh, wow. Okay, so... Eisner Award winner, Joe Schuster Award winner, Star Wars mm-hmm. artist now. Are there any more career highlights still left to be achieved? Yeah, yeah, there, there, there are. Like, I, I definitely want to, I mean, because I did co-write the story with, with uh, for stars, but now I want to like fully just tell my own story and and draw uh, that story within Star Wars. Uh, that would be a dream. So there's that. I I got to do more of that for for Marvel recently for uh, Marvel Unlimited for their app because because I, I uh, I'm working on uh, five issues for X Men Unlimited and yeah I, I've I've just been gushing over like my my love of X Men since you know the '90s has come back but like I, I like. Like I had to like catch up on a lot of X Men titles to see where the characters that I want to work on, like what they've been up to, uh, before I I can tell their stories. So that that's been a dream to to write and and draw and and color these stories to to showcase to people like this like I am a storyteller. I'm not just like a comic artist that Chip hired like me and Chip are partners. Like we, like I want to uh, let people know that. And, and Chip ha- has uh, also expressed that, especially through his newsletters that, yeah, like Jason is, is a phen- phenomenal uh, storyteller. He's not just an artist. So uh, like, I want to do more of that. Uh, I-, I got to do a lot of that this year, actually, it's especially for, uh, I did a short for Stillwater, another project that Chip is working on. So your uh, 2022 is off to a really good start, I'd say. It's been a very busy, hectic start, and I'm almost burning out, but I'm near that finish line. Uh, like, I, I <laughs> within, like, like s- since the start of December, I wrote, drew, colored about three stories for X-Men Unlimited. I wrote two more scripts actually three more scripts for for marvel unlimited uh i I, there's that still water comic that i did uh and i'm i'm back at working on the future issues of all-nighter so that that's only been three months (laughs) and and i think i've i've worked on like over a hundred pages worth of comics <laughs> uh and I'm, I'm just looking forward to just taking it easy this summer <laughs> i'll bet i'll bet how do you balance your life though how do you avoid hitting that point where you just totally burn out uh I, it, it's all about time management and making sure i do not work during the weekends um and, and, and the tricky thing is i also work a nine to five day job as well on top of all of this so, you know, as I said before, Jamie Madrox, the multiple man, is my favorite character. I sometimes feel like I am him. Like, I want to be him. I, I aspire to be him in real life. But I'm only me. Um, but I want to create that illusion that I'm, I, I, can do, I can do it all. 
which I've, you know, I, I've done so far, but, uh, but yeah, like you, you got to make sure uh, to find those breaks <laughs> to, to just take it easy and, and just, just lie down and read or just lie down and just do nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Uh, what's that like, man? I, w- I wish I could do that one. I, I, I have a hard time not working because like for me, if I have a day where I have nothing necessarily planned, I'd be like, okay, but let's make, let's make sure we get some work done too. Let's work on the podcast. Let's work on like the audiobook project. Let's do some stuff for the day job. Let's not just, you know, fruit, let's, let's not just, just like uh, toss the day away watching movies. No, no, let's make sure we get something done. And then I got to stop myself and say, yeah. no, 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 Max, take the day off. You need this. There's lots of sacrifices like not being able to finish Peacemaker or a bunch of other shows. Yeah, like I, I, I'm, I just accept the fact that there's there's a lot of shows that I'm just gonna have to catch up on once I'm done Volume One. I know once I'm done Volume Two of All Nighter. <laughs> My girlfriend bought me a, a a Nintendo Switch for Christmas. And I rarely played it. I probably put in about three hours since Christmas. Yeah, it's it's funny. I I, I charged this up like maybe two weeks ago, and since I've charged it, I haven't even played with it, and the batteries are already dead. Oh, <laughs> I just let the batteries die because uh. uh, I've just been too busy just drawing. One one of my enjoyments so far has been catching up on a lot of X Men titles, like reading house of x power of x x of swords x of whatever like 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 yeah it it, it, less goes on i I, i'm sort of caught up now and uh yeah that that's been my inter source of entertainment but it's also been my research for work (laughs) (laughs) exactly it's it's uh it's like your chill time slash homework yeah, definitely. Oh, man. Oh, man. Now, you mentioned something earlier that I want to touch on for a little bit. Um, talking about, you know, you're not just an artist, but you're also a storyteller. Do other artists also find that they have to sort of prove themselves in that way? Like, hey, I'm not just a person to draw things. I am also a storyteller. No, everyone's different because, you know, th- there are people that, like, I-, I know a bunch of friends that do beautiful illustrations, but, you know, they, they prefer just doing the art like just relying on stone to to to, uh you know write the script but for me you know i i've been making indie comics ever since i was in high school like i was making like xerox mini comics selling them at the school cafeteria uh like this this has always been a passion of mine like i want to make a name for myself where I, I I I can take full ownership of of the thing that I'm working on, because I I'm a bit of a control freak, and, and sometimes I, I can be uh, a bit picky about like how I want things to be. But you you know, I I wrote about I wrote two scripts that other artists got to draw for Marvel Un- Unlimited, and that was that was one of my first in in my comic career where. I had to make sure to be very descriptive with uh, and very precise with with what I want to see in each uh, panel, and I think it really helps when you're an artist uh, who works visually and, and and you are able to translate that into a comic script because you know most writers who are not artists, especially when it comes to a fight scene, they can just say, "I, I want three panels of a fight scene." And it will rely on the artist to to choreograph all that. But for me, like I, I'm very particular about how I want these action scenes to to show uh, on the page. So, uh, man, and and the editors that I got to work with found the perfect artists that would match the tone of the the tones of each story that that I was working on that that I was writing for for Marvel Unlimited. Man, what what a what a story, what a journey. So we talked, of course, about the forthcoming new issues for the All Nighter, Volume Two, in the works. Um, what is but what else is next for you? What's on your like, you know, to do list, which I'm sure is you know down to the floor at this point. I'm I'm hoping that you know, like after working on, I like after 
you know, writing and drawing and coloring my own stories for Marvel Unlimited. I'm hoping the editors were impressed by that tryout. <laughs> I'm putting in quotation marks and, and uh, hoping that they could give me a print title that I can work on for, for Marvel, a mini series that I can do while I'm working my nine to five job. That, that would be the next step for me. Uh, Hopefully they they get me to draw write and draw more uh, Jamie Madrox. <laughs> Always love Multiple Man. He was like one of my like favorite characters for X uh, for X Factor. I thought, man, I would love to have that power, especially now. It's like that'd be such a practical ability to have. Well, yeah, he he he's he. Uh, I actually put him on this wild adventure with the strong guy, and and every idea that I came up with uh, and pitched it to Lauren Emero, uh the Marvel editor, she was gamed with that. Like there was no pushback. So I, I felt like th- this this was just awesome that they allowed me to tell a like a story that I wanted to tell between these two characters. And I, and I got more ideas that I, that I want to work out with them. It's a three part adventure that you'll find only on the Marvel Un- Unlimited app, and we get to see them finally catch up after them being dead multiple times including strong guy and then coming back being like you know in the krakoa era and saying hey let's let's hang out like the old days nice nice well folks at marvel if you're listening to this give this man a print book make it happen he's got the skills online community let's get the word out let's get everyone talking give this guy a print book let's make this thing happen 2022 folks let's make it happen Yes. All yeah. right. All right. Well, Jason, uh, this has been really cool talking to you, of course, loving All Nighter. And again, folks, March 16th, this is the day. Put it on your calendars. It'll be in stores. Um, lots of ways you can order it. Go to your comic shop, but they don't have it. Say, I want a copy. They can make this thing happen. They're very good at, you know, making the orders, getting stuff in that they, that, that they uh, don't, I don't have. And just stock the shelves. Tell them, fill your shelf, fill the whole shelf of All Nighter because it's going to go fast. And after lift, they go right beside each other. It works perfectly. Uh, and uh, definitely follow this guy on Twitter, Instagram. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, Rubble underscore low, L O O, on Twitter. And Jason Lowe makes comics on Instagram. Ah, follow him on these various platforms. Check his work out. It's so cool. And uh, looking forward to next time, maybe uh, All Nighter Volume 2 or Marvel Print Book. We'll see what happens. Fingers crossed. All right. Jason, take care of yourself, man, and looking forward uh, to the next uh, conversation. Thanks for having me again, Max. Hi, this is singer Kate Eppers, and you're listening to Citywide Blackout. Picture this. You finished your first book and nailed it. The plot, the characters, all the twists and turns. This one's a winner, and all you need is the right cover. If you've got my art skills... This is the part where panic usually sets in. Enter the cover villain, hero to writers everywhere. Founded by noted author Remy Flagg, cover villain focuses on composite image covers for science fiction and fantasy writers. Give them the details, and they'll craft a cover using popular trends that everyone will want to see. But wait, you say, I've got ideas of my own. No problem, as cover villain loves a good collaboration. As they say, Our goal is to put a little villain in every cover we make. Want to know more? Then head to CoverVillain.com and follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Okay, everyone, that brings this episode to a close. Big thanks to Jason for joining me. And definitely check out the all-nighter available on Comixology Originals and March 16th at comic shops near you. You can follow the show on Facebook under Citywide Blackout and Twitter and Instagram under Citywide Max. Get at me at citywidemax at yahoo.com and check out the show wherever you find your podcasts, as well as every Saturday at 10 p.m. on Boston Free Radio. As always, keep those ears open.